my name is Gina White. Um, I, I love these these panels that we're doing. So I'm really glad to be part of them. Um, uh, my background is in tech. I did a lot of tech for a long time, and I've been taking a vacation from that. I'm doing some volunteering when I figure out what I want to do when I grow up. And, um, yeah, I'm really excited. We've got some great panel members, and this is going to be good. Uh, I think we should just dive in. Um, typical format is we have everybody speak. We'll take, we'll take turns. And then at the end, we'll open it up for questions from the audience. And when we get to that point, you can direct the questions to the panel in general or to individual people if you want to follow up on something they said. And a round of applause for the panel. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julia Serena, um, and I'm a writer and activist. Um, and so, in thinking about this, I figured it would probably be best to kind of focus on both the little small window of the world that I've seen over the last getting scarily close to 50 years. Um, and, and also to talk about a lot of things that I've observed and written about, thinking about identity labels um, in trans and queer communities. And, and, and my perspective, I should say, is as a trans woman who uh, my first interactions with trans community happened in the early 90s, uh, pre-internet world. And uh, during a time when uh, TVTS was the, the inclusive label <laughs> um, in those worlds. And at the time, those, the commu all communities, queer communities, and especially trans communities, were very isolated. And I would say, for the most part, like gender identity labels in those communities that I first entered into were very much right out of <coughs> medical discourses. Um, we were transvestites or transsexuals. That was it, those are the two options. <laughs> um, MTFs, FTMs. And that was pretty much the, the language that we had. And we, I would be at meetings and people are like, oh, so you're a cross-dresser, right? And I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't really, I don't really fit in that, but I don't think I'm this, I, I don't think I'm transsexual. Um, but it was, the, the identity labels were very few and very rigid, and I think a lot of it was because we were so isolated that maybe individual people would come up with, I identify as this, but there wasn't really an effective way to communicate. Maybe you could communicate with your friends, your community, mm -hmm. but like we were so isolated. I was in Kansas when I came out or to this community, and it was, while this was happening, Gender Outlaw came out. I didn't hear one person talk about Kate Bornstein's book, Gender Outlaw. Like, we didn't even know in this trans community that this, what would become a fairly influential book came out. Mm -hmm. And um, then what I saw over the, the, the years was books like Gender Outlaw and Leslie Feinberg's writings and other people's books really started both challenging medical discourse language and also kind of breaking out of the idea, well, you don't have to be man or woman, you don't have to be a TV or TS. Um, and it was around that time that I started hearing kind of a multiplicity of different identities. Um, the first one that I really resonated with was by gender um, that I had heard. I would later hear genderqueer, and I was real excited about that and called myself that for a while. And so, and, and especially with the internet then, there was a way for this information about labels to sort of spread out. And over the years, there have been many, 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 many labels. I feel like even though I've been involved in trans communities for how many years, um, I still feel like every year I, I hear one or two or four mm -hmm. more labels, um, which I, I find really amazing. And uh, so much to the point now that like you see like conservative bloggers complaining about 60 different gender identity labels on Facebook. Ah, I hate the world. Um, so all that's been really amazing, and, and finding a label that works for you is really empowering and it opens up new doors. I think that's really amazing. But one thing that I want to talk about with the rest of my time that I think is really important is that of contentious arguments I've had within communities, probably more of them have been about identity labels than maybe anything else. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about why that is. 
and uh, thinking about the way in which gender labels don't work like other identity labels. Um, so for instance, um, when I call myself a musician, uh, nobody makes any assumptions necessarily about like what instruments I play, or what types of genres of music I like, right? Like it's just a word that just is a general category of things. But when you say words like woman, or transgender, or dyke, like there are all these assumptions and images that people conjure up of what that means. And I think that a lot of the kind of always coming up with new labels is often related to trying to escape assumptions from these other labels. Like, well, I'm a woman, but I'd like to do these things that aren't considered womanly, and you know, that like trying to avoid those assumptions. Um, and a related thing is also the way in which gender labels are relational in a way that most labels aren't. So if I were to call myself a dog person, and then later I told you that I had a cat, you would be like, wait, you just said you are a dog person. How does it have a cat? You've been lying about being a dog person. You're not a real dog person, right? And, um, but gender labels are like that. Like if you say you're feminine, then that implies that you're not masculine, etc. cetera. And um, also because of, I think both of those issues tie in a lot with another issue that I find um, plagues identity, poli identity label politics conversations is respectability politics. Um, and I've seen this happen over and over, and I feel like this happens slightly different variations of the same conversation has been happening like the whole entire time I've been involved in communities where one group like we used to call it the transsexual versus transgender debate um, where some people decide well I'm transsexual and that's different from transgender and I'm a real woman and these well, transgender really a girl there a real woman thing no sorry <laughs> that's my that's my uh, that's my big entrance nice to have you um but yeah but so some people will use that and say, I'm this and I'm not that, right? And respectability politics can cut different ways in different communities. And I've, I've experienced people who I identified as SA drag queens who were insisting they were nothing like transsexuals and transsexuals doing that to cross-dressers and cross-dressers doing that to gender queer people and over and over and that slices every single way. Um, and then another thing that I think that plays into is a lot of times people try to, for example, a word like transgender, which is considered an umbrella word, and it's supposed to have all of the different gender variant identities and possibilities within it. Um, and so sometimes people will like kind of want to leave the umbrella. Or sometimes one group that maybe has, uh, dominates conversations or has a, a larger voice in one of those in the transgender umbrella will kind of sort of decide what transgender means in a way that excludes other people. And um, one of the things that I try to stress a lot um, in my writings and, and conversations I have about this is that every single word that we have in human language, or the, the human language, in all languages, every single word is an umbrella word, right? If I say bottle, right, I'm not talking about one specific type of bottle. Every single word. Um, and even if you get to really specific identities, some people might think that, oh, I'm a transsexual, or I'm this, and they, they have this very specific idea in mind, but every single time you have a very specific idea in mind of what a label means, you're basically excluding other people who also potentially fall out of that label. And then finally, um, the thing that I wanted to kind of end with, and uh, just to be sure I haven't found it, um, is, and this came up out of writing that I was doing around um, the T word. Um, I wrote a piece a couple years ago called A Personal History of the T Word, uh, by which I mean training. Um, and the way in which that has changed over the course of my life. And it, the word has a very interesting history in that it started as an umbrella term for drag and transsexual women. And then it was appropriated by the sex industry, um, and then got bad connotations. And then around the time that I um, 
came into the, the trans and queer communities here in the Bay Area, that was a really, it was a reclaimed word that everybody was using. And, mm -hmm. um, it was the self-empowering thing to retake that word. And then to watch over the last 10 years, the word become, you know, oh, this is a slur, you can't say this anymore. And I was thinking a lot about that. Um, and in the piece that I write, which you could search with that title, you could Google that, my name, and you'll find the piece. Um, in the second half of the piece, I talk about what I call the activist language merry-go-round, which I think applies in general in activism. Um, I think especially trans and queer communities are particularly accept, uh, susceptible to it because of the way in which we tend to come out <coughs> to a community at a particular defined time mm -hmm. um, in a way that we're not associated with the history that happened beforehand. And a lot of times people are really, really active for a while um, because they've just come out and this is everything to them, and then they essentially sort of become less active in the community and then a new cohort of people become really <coughs> active. And I think a lot of what drives the, the, this merry-go-round, this activist language merry-go-round, is stigma. That if you're trans communities, if you're a marginalized community, every word associated with you becomes stigmatized. And I think that we, A, want to separate ourselves from the stigma, and B, we can't really do a whole lot. Okay, yeah, I'll be done for that. Um, we can't really do a whole lot individually to affect all the systemic problems we face, right? If I can't access health care, um, if I'm you know, having problems getting a job because I'm trans, or for some other reason, I can't really those are major systemic problems. But language, I have a certain amount of control over. I can control the language that I use, and I can, to a certain degree, um, I don't want to say police, because that's a very strong word, um, but I can um, interact with people that I'm talking to and say, that's a bad word, don't use that. I prefer this word. This word is the right word. Um, so I think that that's a lot of it. and. I think that the couple things that I say in that piece after thinking about this a whole lot um, is that I think it's a, I don't think that there's anything in and of itself wrong with finding a new identity label. That could be a great thing. But a lot of times choosing a new label, saying this is the right word, implies that other words are wrong words, right? Um, you know, we're transgender is fine and of itself, but that can be used in a way to say, but oh, calling yourself transsexual is bad, or calling yourself this is bad. Um, I think the second thing is, because of these sort of, I think of it as cohorts of people kind of come out around the same time and use a lot of the same language, and then a new cohort comes around and starts using different language, there can be a lot of real huge generational divides because of that. Um, and one kind of related to, I was talking about how influential Kate Bornstein was, and a few years ago, when a lot of the, the T-word debates were raging, there was a lot of community pressure on her to like stop using the word tranny. And she's like, I've been using this word my whole life. Like, how can you tell me that? The word, you may think it means this, but it, I think it means this. Um, and I've experienced a lot, because I used the word transsexual in the subtitle of my first book. Um, as a, a, a self-identity label and a, a standpoint from which I was writing at, and I've heard a lot of pushback, people saying, you can't use the word transsexual anymore. It's like, but I have been for like 20 years. Um, so, so recognizing that there can be explosive tendencies with that. Um, another problem can be legibility in that I think it's fine to come up with new gender labels. I think they can do real good challenging people outside of our community to think about gender as expansive, you know, like here, gender queer, I never heard the word gender queer before. A gender, what's a gender? It, it does force people, provoke them to like, think about things differently, to challenge their ideas. Um, but there can also be a negative problem with legibility, where, um, if you're calling yourself something that other people don't understand, sometimes that can have a negative effect. And, and I've, I thought about that with 
some pressure that has been put on uh, non-monosexual communities to that there have been claims that the word bisexual reinforces the gender binary, which I've argued against vociferously. Um, but one of the main points I make in that is people have been using bisexual for a while. If I tell my parents I'm bisexual, they know what that means. If you force me to use pansexual or polysexual, there's nothing wrong with those terms. People should use those terms if they want to. But there can be a problem with legibility where words that we use to communicate things, there can be difficulty in um, getting that across. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the other thing is, I think the important thing is the thing that makes the merry-go-round stop is not finding the right word, but is losing the stigma. Okay, mm -hmm. this is the last thing I'm saying. Um, we say gay and lesbian not because those were the right words. Other words that came before and alternative words could have been the words that people use, but those were the words around the time that the tide was pushed on stigma, right? And so saying that you're gay or lesbian now does not have the stigma that it did 20 years ago. And if the stigma left earlier, we might all be calling ourselves homophiles, right? Or pansies, yeah. or you know, lots of different things. So basically, those are some of the thoughts that I wanted to share with you and looking forward to hearing what everyone else says and what you all think. So. so I'm going to talk a little bit about this topic too, but through the experiences I have in different organizations I'm a part of. Um, as well as through some of the thoughts of people who uh, think I think is interesting, but I don't necessarily agree with everything that all the quotes I'm about to share. Um, just want to put that out there. One of the groups I belong to, um, since I moved to the Bay Area, is called Girl Army, and it's a collective. For the sex, it's dedicated to peer taught, affordable, physical, and psychological self defense for women and trans folks in Oakland. Um, and the collective, I thought that this actually, when Gina has to speak on this topic, the work of the collective came to mind kind of immediately. Um, the, we end up teaching a lot of self-defense classes, not only by the passions that people have in the community, so people approach us with things they want to happen, but then also um, with the passions of people that are in the collective. And inside the collective, the collective started in the 90s, um, and it was originally, I think, started out just as self-defense for women, perhaps. Um, and has expanded to a lot of different types of gender orientations. And within the group, there are actually a lot of um, people who identify their gender fluid people, people who identify as gender queer, uh, people who identify as agender, et cetera. Um, and we ended up having a lot of different classes this spring. We had people of color class that had people of all genders. I don't think there weren't any cis men, but there were a lot of other different types of people that came through for that class. And then we had a um, class for trans men and masculine of some people, and then another class for trans women, um, and a class for sex workers, um, things like this. And I guess it's interesting because inside the group we take such good care to respect each other's genders. Um, people take such good care of each other and of the people who attend our workshops, and that's great. But even within the collective, sometimes we have discussions about a lot of aspects of it, but that even the name, um, in terms of our programming, it's really community-based, but the name itself almost doesn't really fit. I feel like when the collective started, the people who were still a member of it um, from the beginning were like 90s people who were into the right girl scene, and a name kind of came out of that, you know? And so um, it's just interesting because at this point, we, once we taught the PSC class, there were a lot of people who identified not as women and were like that. You know, you should think about that name. Do you still want that name? I know why you all have the name. You still want it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that we are thinking about do you still want it? Does it still make sense for um, and the work army too? I mean, you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> the work is good, you know. Um, but yeah. Um, so let's see. Bring that up. I also am the executive director of um, Double Union which is a feminist community workshop and makerspace here in San Francisco. It's a patriarchal people, and Gina is also a member. Um, and we have, it's, it's a cool place. I was there just before here, it's at the clubhouse. There's tons of materials, and there's 3D printers, and it's, it's a really cool dynamic space in terms of um, a cool place to work on a lot of different types of projects and hold a lot of events. I've held film screenings there and things like that. But when it came to our membership qualifications, we just actually recently started, I think, so originally WNN kind of started um, 
out of some negative experiences people had, women had in spaces that were maker spaces or hacker spaces where they experienced discrimination. Um, and so it started out as a safe space for women. Um, and I think that the membership criteria has grown and grown and grown. In the second paragraph, you see they have to keep the focus on a great on a great space for women, trans, cis, queer, straight, and not fitting into those labels or other. All members must identify as women in a way that's significant to them. And when Gina actually asked me to be a part of this panel, I thought this was really perfect because I think I was telling Gina like about a week and a half ago or something. I was in like a three and a half hour long like process meeting where we all like talk about the, you know, there are many of us who thought that and when it comes to who's actually members in the organization or in the collective, it's not really collective, but the organization, people identify a lot of different ways. But when it came to really, and so I felt like, oh, well, this is a natural author of the conversations we're already having. People are already non-binary in here and already gender queer in here. We just need to change the language so people feel comfortable applying. Um, but the conversation got a lot more complicated because then there were all of these things that were kind of left over from when it was supposed to be a safe space. I think for women, there were like a lot of cis women having a lot of feelings about um, what what's safe and like who who is as if as if and I mean I'm saying this as executive director, uh, you just get a group of random women in one place and everyone is like safe. So <laughs> you know, it's just um, but so I feel like because I was like yeah well it's also you know I love my organization and it's it has a long way to go in being as racially diverse as I would like it to be and so I don't necessarily feel safe with all these people who are not who are white. You know, like safety is not at hand all the time. But it's something that we're thinking about right now, and um, I hope that you'll have to figure out what membership <coughs> draft. Because even when I went to apply to be a member, I was kind of like, well, I don't know. What am I supposed to do? That's good. Uh, <laughs> so I know that people must be feeling that way. And when we sent out the invitation for the discussion, people were really excited. Um, just a quote from Janet Mock, um, who is a goddess. Though how we grow up to fit neatly into the gender binary, in the binary, I believe in self determination, autonomy, and people have the freedom to proclaim who they are and define gender for themselves. Our genders are as unique as we are. No one's definition is the same, and compartmentalizing a person as either a boy or a girl based entirely on the appearance of genitalia at birth undercuts our complex life experiences. Um, also, a quote from Leslie Feinberg um, Gender is the poetry each of us makes out of the language we are taught. And I feel like both those quotes kind of get something that I want to talk about a little bit, which is just that it's just obviously super complicated. Um, it's the language that we're taught, but then I think part of the panel is like, it's also the language we create. And I also feel like, um, so we get a language that we're immersed into, and we get our definition to describe who we are. <laughs> And uh, it's, it is beautiful, and it does give a person a definition to have. I think I agree with you so much in having um, a way to, to define our experience through language and not be defined necessarily by other people solely. Um, but I also feel like creating, whenever, there are always new labels because none of them are really going to catch the thing. It's just the language we have to try to get at the experience that's not really. It's going to elude language to a degree, and so there'll always be this generation of um, new language to describe and experiences more completely, um, or attempt to. And I think it'll always be kind of an attempt. Oh, so most of the time that I've been an adult, <laughs> I have also been a youth worker. Like I've been a classroom teacher and a school leader, and um, and I feel like. When you were talking about, about the cohorts and generational language, mm -hmm. I also feel that way about I feel like some of the like black feminist language that I was using like the 90s. Like I've seen how people are just like, oh no, we don't say that, we say this. <laughs> um, and because they're they're a part of the new wave of things that's that's coming about. Um, but in terms of how people, I mean I guess you all know, but I've worked with like uh, elementary school school children, middle school kids, high schoolers, I used to teach at Spelman. And um, my mom works with teenage mothers and like infants and really small, like early child. It's something I could never do. She's really a, a brilliant, brilliant person. But um, it starts so early, even before children are like born, like really well meaning guardians and parents. And 
like it, it affects so many things, like what toys they play with, what colors they can be around, like their dreams, their aspirations, their artistic endeavors, um, what, how they move. Like you do something like this gender, that's like this gender. That's not the you know. It's, but it's constant, and people are really well meaning, I think. But it's really horrifying, actually. <laughs> and it's it's a massive part of schooling, I think. Um, and it's one of the reasons I'm just becoming so disenchanted with being a teacher. Um, because it's just really, uh, I think policing is a harsh word, but it's like indoctrination for sure. Like very aggressive, and um, yeah, I don't think people even realize it. But, um, don't really know this person, so if someone knows something about them um, that is that I should really consider, uh, let me know. But I like this quote. Uh, it says, I realize that the English language is sadly devoid of names for people like me. I try to cut the world some slack for this every day, all day, and day, the day after that too. But the truth is that every time I misgender, a tiny sliver of me disappears. Mm -hmm. A tiny little sliver of me is reminded that I do not fit it. I remember that the truth of me is invisible, and a tiny sliver of me disappears. Just a sliver, raised from the surface of my very thick skin those days, but other times right from my soul. And I felt so deep, and other days simply shrug out, but still all those slivers add up to something much harder to pretend around. Um, and I feel like there's been so many times, just taking it back to the point about you, that I've seen children, I mean, and it's interesting because that I've just seen them expressing themselves. They're just being themselves. But the parents around them and their guardians and their peers and all the media they engage in is really just kind of coming down on them that they are not right, but they're six or three or, you know, it's, it's just really, um, it's really, really harsh. Thank you so much. I'm gonna skip this person's thing, but they love the term gender fluid. I agree with them. <laughs> um, I think it just, for me, I think the whole conversation comes down to self determination. Um, Audie Lloyd here in this quote is just talking about, you know, I'm constantly being encouraged to pluck out one aspect of myself and present this as the mean whole, mean, as the mean people eclipsing and denying the other parts of myself. Um, but it's just, it's not the way you want to live. It's not the way you want to live. And I feel like those terms, all the generation of language is people trying to get at, at the thing because they want to, they're trying to catch the energy with language. Um, and so I think it's just going to be, it's going to be like that. Um, and I feel like the, the cohorts, I have some members of my family who, um, but they try to have these discussions with, and it's just, it's hard because for them, they feel like, oh, well, it's just too much language. I can't keep up with it. It's too exhausting. I'm just not going to try. But it's like, again, people are creating the language to get at their experience. And it's not too hard. It, you know, it's just, it's just something to keep up with. Um, uh, Maggie Nelson, I think she wrote a book called The Argonauts. How does one get across the fact that the best way to find out how people feel about their gender, excuse me, or sexuality, or anything else really is to listen to what they tell you and to try to treat them accordingly without shellacking over their vision of reality with yours. And I feel like that's kind of just like what it boils down to for me. Like whatever a person says to me their gender is, um, what am I going to say? Nah. Obviously, <laughs> 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 they get to guess like, well, I don't know, you actually look like this. Like, no, you don't get to say. They get to say. Um, yeah. How we feel about recall, but like this quote: "Knowing your name is your identity in the material realm is also just your drag, and the real you is the energy force that creates the universe." Mm -hmm. um, and I think to get back to, I feel like the rise of the internet. I'm not old enough to have lived a long time and be conscious of my time before the internet, but it came about when I was like a teenager, and I do feel like it's created so much more space for people to communicate what they feel about their language and to think with communities all over the world. I know in my town as a teenager, I had, I was like pre-internet. I was just stuck with people I lived in my vicinity with, which sucked. You know what I mean? Even if you're a teenager now and you have the internet, you can talk about your feelings and your identity with a lot of different kinds of people. And I feel like it just made the teenage level was so much more open in a way because they're used to it. This is just what it is. The machine moves fast. Keep up. Um, <laughs> in a way that I feel like where the internet, yeah, and it's hard for me to even really imagine the internet. One time, one of my kids picked like a big PHS to go on like a project, and I was like, you know what that is? And she was like, 
A cassette tape? Oh. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> okay. Okay, you got to get it. But I mean, that's just the world they live in. Anyway, I, I just wanted to say all that to say that I really feel like all the gender labeling and the generation of language around gender is just about self-determination, people deciding for themselves who they are. And um, I think it's a beautiful thing. I think it's a thing that once you create the language for something, then you have to kind of, it gives definition, but it also can be kind of restricting um, because it, it creates, I mean, it's not the same, but I think about what being black is to me, and I feel like it's a term, and it's supposed to encapsulate this thing, but it means so many different things to everyone who is that. Mm -hmm. um, and my definition of it might not include you. Like, I don't know, are you, you know what I mean? Like, it, it does that too. Like, it's like, oh, I know what I think it means, but what you're doing doesn't fit the that. So I think that, I think that we just are gonna have to be really, ride the wave of all the language and gender, and um, thank you for listening. So today there was a news report. Oh, I'm Don Romsberg, and uh, uh, I'm a um, historian of the queer past. I'm also a professor of women and gender studies at Sonoma State University, and I feel uh, extremely grateful that I get to teach in women and gender studies as a cis white dude. Um, it, it's, uh, it's been a real gift to, uh, to me to be able to, to have that be my calling. And, um, uh, so one of the things that I've been super involved with for the last five years is um, trying to make sure that um, our public education system in California in its K-12 history social science curriculum uh, is inclusive of LGBTQ people in the past. And um, one of the things that when we started to think about how the K-12 history science framework of the state should be reframed, one of the things that we really started, that we really talked about as scholars and as activists and advocates and students and teachers and parents, was that um, we really wanted to make sure that it wasn't just like, um, oh, here's a famous trans person, and here's a famous bisexual person, and here's a famous lesbian, and here's a famous gay, and that that wasn't the way that we approached it, but that we really thought about how the K-12 journey could be a, a journey where you understand that the existence of gender diversity is real and changes over time and place, that you understand that uh, family diversity is real and changes over time and place, and that uh, what we can clumsily call same-sex relationships and identities um, also um, change over time and place. And that if people could understand that as part of history education, which is really about teaching you how to be a, a citizen in a diverse and complex society, right? Understanding from the past to sort of build into the present. If you could understand those things from your K-12 education, how incredible would that be? Like if that was your takeaway, is that gender is diverse and contextual, and um, that uh, how that has uh, happened in the past can inform the way we imagine our futures, like that would be a really big accomplishment, right, for a K-12 history education. So, um, so we approached it, um, and, and we're actually remarkably successful in um, uh, July of last year, the new state history social, social science framework came out, and it was a lot of lobbying and a lot of pushing and a lot of tedious going to Sacramento and talking to these people who looked bored and at you and you talked for one minute and then 20 other people talked for one minute behind you about something else, right? I mean, it was a, it was a, it, it was a lot. Um, but uh, we ended up getting um, LGBTQ content in grades two, four, five, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. So, so, yeah. Um, and um, a couple of things really facilitated this. One was the Fair Education Act, which was passed in 2012, which mandated the roles and contributions of people with disabilities and LGBT Americans be included in history education. Um, and then the other thing is it was sort of the right time and place with sort of the marriage equality movement, everything that was happening, Democratic governor, um, California, for whatever reason, the religious right sort of abandoned the fight early on. <laughs> They decided, I guess, to go attack third world nations on their health policies or something else, right? I mean, seriously, that's probably what they did. Um, 
so um, uh, we were able to sort of get this through with remarkably little um, resistance. The challenges were sort of indifference uh, and bureaucracy and inertia rather than outright house hostility. Um, so um, imagine my surprise when I came to read today. Um, that's something from CBS News in Sacramento. Parents outraged by transgender reveal in kindergarten class. <laughs> The Rockland Academy School Board is facing tough questions from parents concerned over a controversial incident involving transgender discussions inside a kindergarten class. Um, uh, and then someone named Karen England from the Capital Resource Institute said parents, the parents feel betrayed by the school district that they were not notified that the book I Am Jazz was being read to kindergarten. And like this is uh, uh, kids. Um, uh, there was even a... Um, quote that was given saying um, um, a parent, a parent, an unnamed parent, said, my daughter came, cry came home crying and shaking, so afraid she could turn into a boy. Yeah. Well, so I went and I looked at sort of who Karen England was and um, this Capital Resource Institute, and they are this super far right group that kind of got chased out of California in years back for tax evasion kind of stuff. And, like, <laughs> and, and then they tried to sort of set up sort of their shop in Reno, and it sounds like she's back, right? Um, so it's unclear how much of this uh, controversy actually happened, whether or not there was a shaking child trembling with the possibility of gender diversity or not, right? Um, <laughs> the question that raised for me was what kind of gender terror are they putting on this child that such a thing would be so terrifying to her that she would tremble with fear, right? I mean, I was really like, how, how would that come about, right? And so I was like, the work that we're doing is, is really important. Like, this is why, this is exactly why we're doing this work. This is exactly why we're doing it. And um, so anyway, so that kind of um, led me to think about two different things. One is that we're now trying to get the textbook companies to actually have their textbooks reflect the new framework. As you can imagine, this is hard. Um, so um, this summer, that was something that I spent a lot of time on, was reviewing all the proposed textbooks from Houghton Mifflin and McGraw Hill and all these places that you might right, remember that from school, right? Um, and one of the things that they were all fairly willing, except for Houghton Mifflin, they're really bad, um, to, to put in was Charlie Parkhurst. So I don't know if you know who Charlie Parkhurst is, but we got Charlie into the framework. Charlie was a stagecoach driver in the Old West uh, for Wells Fargo at different times, um, um, lived his life as a man, um, um, came out west to live his life as a man, um, voted as a man uh, in California, and um, <clears throat> was in male professions throughout his adult life. And then when he died, um, um, Right, there was, as these 19th century stories often went, there was the big reveal, right? That, whoa, right? Um, um, bodily sex that identified, would have identified him as um, a female, right? Um, so we were very careful in the framework to language this in a way that, that left uh, indeterminate the, the, or open the reasons why someone might do this, right? And, and there are lesson plans and curriculum that have been developed around, for fourth graders, around like, why would someone do this, right? <laughs> well, maybe you do it because like economic opportunity in the West, like that would be a real good way to do that, to have more opportunity than you would as a, as a female, as a, as a woman, right? Uh, you might do it um, because that's who you want to be. You might do it for both of those reasons. You might do it because mobility for somebody who is female body is a hell of a lot easier uh, in the West, if you are seen as a man, right? So um, every one, every textbook publisher that included Charlie Parkhurst misgendered her as her, right? And said, and said, um, you know, something like Charlie Parkhurst, nothing about gender, and then. It turned out she was a she. Like, I mean, literally, like, replicating the, the newspaper, sensationalist newspaper articles of the 19th century in the way in which they represented Charlie. So we worked very hard with the publishers to reframe that. And one of the changes that we really encourage them to do is they always have, like, this box or this chapter or this section that says, women in the West. And then Charlie Parker was thrown in that category, right? Because they talk about pioneering women, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And women in the West, and then there's Charlie. 
And so we said, what if you changed the title of that to Gender in the West? Mm -hmm. Like just one word change, right? And it opens up like the way in which you might explore that. You might explore the ways that men might come to the West because it's a way that you can be around a lot of guys and <laughs> explore your life in that way, right? Um, so kind of alternative kinds of don domesticity. Um, and we also encourage um, uh, the framework now says that in uh, California history in fourth grade, in fifth grade early American history, and in ninth grade, or sorry, eighth grade 19th century history, you're supposed to say something about Native American gender and family diversity. And in eighth grade, we specifically name it as two spirit. And uh, so the state document says this. Well, no publisher said anything about gender diversity or two spiritedness in any of their materials. So we push them very hard on that. And there, it's an open story. The story does not have like a, I'm not going to be like, and we got it, right? Because I don't know where we are. We're, in, we're midstream in that right now. We're literally in the place where publishers are responding to the concerns of the public. And then the what's called the Instructional Quality Commission is going to make a decision about that in the next few months. How much time do I have? Five minutes, perfect. OK. So um, um, all this is to say that um, um, these battles around language and, uh, and, and how we use this language um, uh, to think about the past and how it connects. I loved sort of what you said and what you said and how it kind of connected to what I was going to say. We didn't plan that, but um, <laughs> the stakes of what, of the language that we give kids to use as their frames of analysis of their ways in which to render reality and to interpret it, right, are important for them individually and we do talk about like how gender expressive children need to have this, right? I mean, we know the stakes for them and how high it is, right? Um, but it's also important for all the other kids to have that, those frames, right? And, um, and so, um, so I just wanted to sort of say that and then um, I'm gonna sort of flip to something different, which is another project I was working on this summer uh, was um, with um, several people who are looking, doing a retrospective of Outlook magazine, which came out from um, the late 90s, through, or late 80s through the early 90s. And it was in this moment pre-internet, when, and pre sort of queer studies existing, um, when public intellectuals and academics and activists and others were all part of this one magazine. And it was, it's really amazing, and, and the project is called Outlook and the Birth of the Queer. But one of the things that was really uh, troubling and brought back a lot of like intense feelings for me was how completely absent trans people are from it. Completely. Dis as, dis as objects of discussion, as uh, authors, as um, parts of what was imagined in the framing of it, largely as the lesbian and gay community. And these are the people who are on the progressive edge of that community speaking right about the most sort of queering issues of the day. And that total absence led me back to my sort of place as, right, I wouldn't even call myself cis, of course, at that time, but as a cis white gay guy in the 90s who was sort of intellectual, progressive left, queer identified, right? And how much I had to change and evolve uh, in order to um, realize how central transness was for all of us. And um, there was never a time when I was like, transgender people are weird and gross. Like, I wasn't that person. I mean, there were a lot of my brothers, right, who still are, uh, and were them. Uh, and I was uh, glad when there were like the turf wars of whether trans was going to get included in what we thought of as like who was part of our community, and that was really ugly. But um, I just want to say that um, I think that reckoning with that past um, is a way that we can think about the generosity of um, gender labels um, and um, naming moving forward. Um, because the 90s were, I mean, as ugly as the 70s and the 80s were in terms of how lesbians and gays treated trans people, and it was ugly a lot, a lot of it was super ugly. Um, the 90s were a really hard time, and I think there's a lot of trauma. It's probably a, too big of a word for it for some of us, but um, there was a lot of um, struggle around 
how we were actually going to, um, to be a community. And I think we owe a lot to gender expressive trans, gender fluid people for coming back over and over again and assisting their, their viability and, and their worth to the rest of us. And we owe them such a gratitude um, for um, allowing us to um, be a part of a community that includes them. So I'm just so, so grateful for that. And I think I'll leave it there. Such good things that people said. Um, I'm just getting over the fact that I got here. Uh, <laughs> as I was telling uh, dear friend Terry here, I was uh, wrestling with Muni that it's like, oh my god, I'm late as we speak. I'm not, I'm not even there yet. Uh, so um, someone, uh, a friend of mine was like, say something witty uh, and like leave that into your thing. Mm, I don't have anything. I'm just glad I'm here. Um, uh, I'm also, I'm, I'm feel fortunate that I got to hear uh, the other panelists say, um, say what they have to say. I'm honestly not sure I can measure up. Um, I, I, where I come from is I, I write a lot. Um, some, I have some work published. I'm, I, I also just write a lot on Facebook. If you're friends on, if you're, if you're friends with me and you, and you're like, rely and you're hoping that I am one of those people who writes, writes one or two word posts and then call a day. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, I, uh, so a lot of my ponderings on um, labels and stuff comes from that. It also comes from uh, my years facilitating um, support groups and other groups for genderqueer and non-binary. Um, so yeah, I certainly don't have the academic chops that you have. I don't have the serious writing chops that you have. Um, and, you know, the community involvement chops that you have. But, you know, we will see how this goes. Um, I, I, um, I will say that um, I identify as, I identify as genderqueer, non-binary, and female-ish. That's right, female-ish. Um, and these are things that are important to me. And, I, and that's really the center part of my, my thing about labels. Like, I, 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 I think Terry said that um, one, of the, one of the things that had me that had him approach me about doing this was I was like ranting about on Facebook because we're friends about um, about how irked I guess I am about people who are um, people who are talking about uh, wishing they had a label free society mm -hmm. and for me you know it's I have to say like my my feelings about labels are just mine. And you know, if you really feel that a label free society is gonna be better for you and those around you, that's great. You know, I, I if we all ultimately I believe we all just want things to be better. That said, I I, I can't every time I read something that says that some, says something to the point of, of why can't we just have a label free society? I can't help but think that that person has amount has the amount of privilege that allow that gives them other agencies to that gives them other agencies to justify to the world around them that they get to be there and they get to be who they are independent of those labels. You know, if, if you're a upper middle class cis white dude with a college education and a white collar job. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe in labels. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, if, yeah, 
Yeah, it really is. Um, you can, like for me, when I hear that, if you're a man, you can afford to, you, for me, you can afford to have all the gender or sexual orientations labels stripped away from you, you will still know who you are. Society will still know who you are, and you will still get respect, the respect and the benefits and the means of survival that one needs to survive in society because all these other things, you're being cisgender, you're being uh, college educated, you're, being, you're, being, you're having a well-to-do well white collar job, will allow you to have all these things that will allow you to have that allow you to still know who you are and get those benefits in society. There are people who I, I know for a fact that if, you know, if they don't get to say that they are a, a black trans woman who, you know, a black trans woman sex worker, blah, 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 they've got nothing, you know? You know, that their labels, so for some people, labels are their agency. Mm -hmm. Labels are their argument that they get to be in this world. You know, I, 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 so that's my main gripe about people who argue about the label free society. If you have the kind of privilege that allows you to sort of advocate for yourself without the use of your labels, then great, I hope you do great work for our world. But there are plenty of people for whom saying who they are, saying those labels is exactly the tools they have to justify who, justify why they get to be here. And, um, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I love how it was mentioned um, by another panelist about, um, I'm not really, I'm not quoting them right, but um, how there is an inequality in, no, there is a privilege in the understanding of activist language. Is that what, is that, does that make sense? Um, that's another thing that I wrestle with a lot. Um, I, you know, for me, I occasionally in my, occasionally in my writing, I use the word cisgender a lot. You know, I occasionally will see me use words like KFAB, coercively assigned female birth, uh, KMAB, co coercively assigned male at birth, blah, 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 you know. And around the people who I associate with, around circles I associate with, those are the accepts. Those are the access acceptable language. Uh, cis male, cis female. I use those a lot. Um, again, because around my people I associate with, that's the accessible language. Honestly speaking, it took me a while to, and I, you know, because it's the accessible, the acceptable language that I, around the people I associate with, it took me a while to have this like knock inside of the head level of, of, of realization that there are plenty of people who are well meant and, you know, um, well meant folks and folks who are down with helping us with the cause, who just don't know the right words to say. Um, you know, if you don't know something, you don't know what you don't know. Um, so, so I, so I am someone who believes in people getting to, you know, use the labels that we all get to use the labels that we get to to define ourselves and create the kind of labels that we get to define ourselves in the existing label, the existing labels don't exist. I also feel that it is 
prudent, I guess, um, to, you know, not necessarily educate, because I don't necessarily believe that it is our responsibility, certainly not without uh, compensation, to educate people for free. You know, as um, I, 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 um, I, oh, sweet. Um, I, um, I, we're not paying the panel. Sorry. Um, um, I, you know, I, um, but I, but I do think that, but I do think that, you know, part of my, part of my um, responsibility, and I guess my, a way, a good way to go about my gender education is to champion the things I want to champion, but also um, to meet people where they are. Uh, I to say people, in a, in a substance abuse sense, I'm a harm reduction person, so mm. more. And I guess in a gender education, in the gender, in gender education sense, so I, I am too. You know, uh, if you, if you are someone who likes to say, you know, bio male and bio female, I will cringe to the end of the earth. But I will still be able to say, what does that mean to you? Um, you know, um, because, because, and really that's what understanding people's labels are. I mean, it's like being able to say, you know, when someone says, like, I'm a, cis, I'm a cis woman, it's like, what does that mean to you? I'm a trans person. What does that mean to you? I'm a, uh, I'm a non-binary, female-ish, uh, gender person. What does that mean to you? Because, because, you know, ultimately, you know, it could be said that, you know, labels separate us, and those who argue that probably have a point. But, but I also feel that labels open up conversations. Mm -hmm. if, if we're able to treat each of those labels as, a con as an opener of a conversation of, who are you? And, you know, um, what is your, what's your deal? Then, then, you know, maybe we're all that. That's it. Thanks, everybody. That was really fantastic. Um, I'm just going to kick it off with a question, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience for questions. Um, a lot of what I heard was about how the labels have been evolving. What's your sense of, are they evolving more quickly? Are they, are there's, my sense is that there's, Sort of an explosion of labels. Is that your sense? Do you see it continuing that way? Directions to that. I can't tell if they're getting their more labels generated more quickly, or if my awareness of mm -hmm. things is right. just mm -hmm. progressing, and I'm just becoming more aware of things. It's hard to tell. Yeah. I would say, if you look at like thinking of Leslie Feinberg's book. Um, I quoted this in a uh, thing that I wrote um, a couple years ago, and it was Leslie Feinberg asked people in the community, what labels do you think fall under the trans umbrella? And it's a whole paragraph. And we probably have way more terms now, but I think maybe that's because we still have some of those old terms, and then there have been like many, many other terms. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, I don't have a sense that it's evolving faster now, but I think that with every year, there's more and more and more. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, we're accumulating many of them, yes. I don't know if other people agree with me. Well, I, I, I will just say that um, as a college professor, as a teacher of college students, um, that certainly it seems like their labels, my students' labels, are proliferating more rapidly now than they were five years ago, which is more rapid than it was five years before that. And so in some ways, I feel like it's, um, I call this student, this group of students that's like now, and the high school students that I encounter now, the Google generation, because um, they can go online and Google everything about who they are and come up with this, I almost, I almost related to like the explosion in sexology in the late 19th century when these medical doctors were creating these taxonomies 
of like inverts and earnings and like all these, right? They're like, do, 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 this is a trans, <coughs> this is a fetishist, and do, 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 right? All these little taxonomies, except that these are taxonomies that are um, being crowdsourced and claimed by the people who are, who are, who are um, enunciating those taxonomies for themselves. And so I think we're in a place where the new technology of, of the internet and social media is allowing for this uh, explosive taxonomy in the same way that the medicalization of sexuality and gender in the late 19th century did the same thing, but with a lot more agency. I'm, I, I'm more or less on the same page. I think, um, I don't know that, I mean, communities of folks or just individual folks are going to be prone to creating words that define who they are if they feel that existing words don't fit. I mean, there's a the popular idea is that the word gender queer happened in the early 2000s. I don't know what that, that is in time. I don't know that that's true. Um, but I certainly, but I certainly know that in when, when I came out in 2001-2, and I, uh, and I found the word genderqueer, um, that made sense to me because I knew I wasn't a boy, I knew I wasn't a girl. Trans sort of worked, but, for, but when I first interacted with the word trans, it felt super binary. And so when I, found, when I found the word genderqueer, it just felt, it just felt like it fit. So I don't know that there are, I don't know that there are, I don't know that there have been more words, labels, than, than there were some years ago. I just feel that, like other people have said, um, technology has allowed us to, you know, um, there are probably, you know, prior to the 19th century, there are probably more people who identified as gay, maybe not in that word, but there were people who identified as gay. But with, but with more media being more of what it is, more and more people were, uh, ex were exposed to the, the ability to identify as such and so people identify as such. You know, um, you know I, I feel the same way with, you know, trans, queer, and uh, gender, and gender, and related labels. Like, you know, there are problems, I know for a fact that there are people who identify as not as as different from than the chromosomal makeup that they uh, that they have, you know, um, not a, um, you know, maybe they, maybe they, a lot of them were born in the time when when there weren't such words, but but they but they always identified as such, and so with with more and more terms coming up, there are more and more people identifying as such, and then they're you know. And, and, and with technology, more and more things open up. Um, so I don't. So I, so like others have said, I don't know that it's labels. There are more and more labels now. It's just I think the fact that labels other than trans, transsexual, transgender, there other than that existing is more of a, is more accessible. There's more accessible information. Than Thank you guys so, this was so informative. I mean, I like to, I teach queer studies and I learned so much in the last uh, hour. So I have like a little bit of a meandering comment and then I'm gonna use the example of cisgender to get at a question, so bear with me. Um, so I think a lot of what you guys were getting at, uh, and I'm putting it in my own terms, is like the necessity of people to deploy labels to be real and material in the world. And so we have on the one hand the idea of identity. And the question for me is like, but what do you make of identification? Of like a different thing with identity about how we look at others and say like, I feel something that resonates with you. And a concern of mine as somebody who teaches queer studies to lots of queer identified students is that they are really enamored right now of the proliferation of identities, but they weaponize them in the classroom as a way of saying, as you put it out, I'm this, 
you're not, you could never understand me, I'm so fucked over, and even if you tried to understand me, you could never. And so what happens is this weird vertiginous black hole of like claiming lots of different identities, but then also using those to say like, I am a singular person that nobody could ever understand. Like I could never be legible and that's my pain, but also like I'm never gonna make myself legible to you. So this is interesting back and forth that I see among my students. And the way I describe it is that there's identities and then there's the aspects behind them. There's like the feelings that we attach to identities. So I guess the question to me is like, how do we produce ever you know, proliferating, complex, rich, generative identities and labels that are effectively ab uh, oriented towards openness, towards people being able to identify across differences? And cisgender is the term that really frustrates me because at the same time that my queer students are enamored of gender transitivity, fluidness, openness, destabilization, they love to claim that other people who they do not know have stable gender identities. Like, I see queer students look at other people and be like, yours is gender. And I'm like, you don't know this person. I'm like, who are you? Why are you even saying that to them? How can you claim that your identity is so open and you don't know, like, what if this person who, let's say, they self-nominated as cisgender, also identifies with gender transitivity or is feels deep connection. Like I, you know, I, all of my, much of my work is about feminism and I'm constantly being asked by people like, what is your identification with like femininity and women and, it, and it's complex. Like those identities are really complicated even though I would say that I'm, ma I'm male body and male identified. So my rant is simply to say, um, you know, how do we, um, how do we produce labels that actually allow for effective openness to cross identification. That the last thing I'll say is that we have so many terms that describe cross difference identification as exploitation, appropriation, violence, etc. We have so few terms to describe identifying with others as a form of openness or empathy or connectivity, and that is concerning to me as we develop new labels, which is exciting to me. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. Should we take a question or just have more response on the ground before we respond? Sure, if you want. Yeah. Go ahead and go back there. I'm wondering about the, so there was this promise with core theory that if we have a proliferation of, ident of identities and labels, then we'll blow up the binaries and we'll able to be in a society that is more equal and equitable. And it was really interesting to listen to because there was so much conversations about Facebook and Google and corporate, um, you know, book uh, sort of sellers. And I'm wondering in, the, in a way as in which maybe those capitalist conglomerates can just totally absorb all those labels, make space for them, allow proliferation of identity, and while doing that, at the same time, not create more inequalities and more exclusion, so very little, few people can be in that room here and have like millions of identities, and the rest are ex like just out of this sort of realm. So I'm wondering, you know, you've been saying like language is so important, but what is the relationship between language and structure in the way in the ways that you're thinking about this this stuff? Damn, you guys are for real. This is like <laughs> real <laughs> question. Yeah, I'm like hot seat. Okay. Like, it's a good <laughs> question. Yeah, I'm yeah, so like the project on first time. <laughs> <laughs> so, I do feel like capitalism will just it just inhales, 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 and inhales. And inhales. And inhales, and it will inhale anything. Will inhale anyone's language. Will inhale anyone's identity easily, with ease, with pleasure. If it can make itself yeah. live longer. So how do you fight that? <laughs> how do we fight it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we should dismantle capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's so obsession with labels, a product of. Uh, Facebook existence. No, I, I, I get you. We fight capitalism by like talking about how hard it is to get on uni from uni here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do feel like the community. May
might be part of the answer to both of kind of what you were saying. To me, I feel yeah. like um, when I was teaching at Spelman, I would see people weaponizing their identities in that way of just like, girl, you could never understand yeah. me. I'm like, <laughs> that's the most popular person in the world. Um, and I feel like maybe that was happening because that they had all came upon these identities kind of in isolation and find them and being able to search and think about who am I and do it um, and really refine it and then trying to reconcile it with what it needs to be in a community with other people and relate to other people in like a positive way. And I feel like the only way, I feel like one of the main ways to undermine capitalism is community. And I feel like even though capitalism can just keep inhaling our shit, we still can resist by building community. I feel like really strive. I have, I mean, I try to articulate that more, but I feel like With regards to the first question, um, I, I definitely have something I would like to say about that. Because um, I observed the community shift from when I was really active in trans queer communities where they overlapped here in the Bay Area um, in the early 2000s. And during that time, well, I would say that a lot of the, the Kate Bornsteins, Leslie Feinbergs, uh, um, Ricky Wilkins, or Wilson's talked about this a lot. Um, there's an idea of trans activism being, hey, we're trans because gender is messed up, and an encouragement of everyone. It's like, and gender screws you up too. Like that was kind of what trans activists then did. It's like this is part of a bigger thing, and it very much resonated with some feminists and and people who are queer, cisgender queer people. We would say now, right? Um, and when I was in those communities, and they were very powerful communities, but what often happened, and there's a whole thing about proliferation of gender, and there are lots of people who were involved in trans communities who were not, today, people would contest whether or not they were really trans, right? And uh, I, during that time, I was one of some people, so it's partly my fault, <laughs> um, who kind of were talking about, like, hey, we're in this queer community, and actual people, this is partly why at the time I embraced the word transsexual. I'm like, actually, some of us who have transitioned, and particularly at that time, trans women within queer communities were, were fairly marginalized. We were kind of a very small contingent. I would go to, like, trans events, and it was a room packed full of people, and there'd be, like, I'd be one of two trans women performers mm -hmm. or something, right? And it was out of that that the, the cisgender discourse came out of. And the point was to say, to talk about, okay, like I celebrate your, celebrating your gender diversity, but there are some privileges that, that some people can have, right? And so it started out as just a general conversation of articulating privilege, which I think is really important. But unfortunately, it's a, a, a built-in thing with privilege discourses that people who are not fully aware or haven't fully thought through so really just want to, like you said, weaponize yeah. privilege, right? And so just saying and, and seeing you, you had the RuPaul quote and like just seeing people today being like, well, this is gender man, blah, blah, blah. It's like, whatever, I, I, I have issues with some things RuPaul has said, but like RuPaul was like, out as in your face gender variant, <laughs> like yeah. you know, like way before you know, a, a lot of us were even here, and even when I was like a closeted young person, it's like so. Anyway, I think that both dialogues can happen at the same time. I would like to see that, and I think it's really hard with the privilege discourse because so many people don't know, don't really think through the fact, like privilege. I think most of us here would understand that there are some things where we're marginalized, and other things where we're privileged, right? Almost everybody has privileges, right? Um, and it's a way to, to recognize, I mean, it's just the reverse course of, the, I like to think of it as, if you understand that people are marginalized and therefore face disadvantages, then some people face advantages. And just, privilege is recognizing your advantages. Um, but, like you said, it gets weaponized. And, but I, would, I think that we could talk, we could have the conversation about privilege, and marginalization, and in an intersectional way that that like can support everybody, but recognize some people are far more marginalized than we are, and support one another. 
and at the same time explore gender diversity. Like, I think we can do both, because gender does screw over everybody. Mm -hmm. To some degree. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, right, without, without um, like we all flow through the streams of capitalism, um, but we don't need to be seduced by it, right? And I think that um, it's hard, because capitalism is hella seductive, right? <laughs> it is, right? But um, to sort of, um, to this point of privilege, right? And, and um, sort of weaponizing the discourse of privilege as a way of um, like seeking to stand above those that you mark as having privilege, right? Um, totally feeds into the same kinds of logic that um, sort of lead us toward, I think, um, kind of a consumer model of, of identification, right? Like, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have this, 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 and this, and since I have these goodies, right, um, this is gonna give me um, um, like a, a, a place to stand from which I can kind of um, feel like I'm richer than you in these ways, because you're richer in like, you know, like these material and other ways, but I'm richer in like right in these ways, and um, and it's a it's a losing game for everybody, just like capitalism, <laughs> right? Although some lose more than others, and so I think I mean your question um, your question is really really a, a super important one, and it takes me back to the '90s and um, trans critiques of Judith Butler, right? for her lack of materiality and in, in the accountability of what she was talking about for actual trans lives, right? Some of which I think was unfounded and some of which I think was super productive and legitimate, right? Um, but I think that we always have to ground identity in material, in materiality and in, in political economy. I think we have to always be doing that. And if we're not doing it, then we've been seduced by somehow imagining that capitalism is on our side and it never is. Yeah. Oh God, I think my, uh, my, horrible, my horrible memory is kicking my ass right now because uh, there are two questions and I can't talk about that. Now I can't remember. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to do my best. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I'm pretty sh I, I, I'm sure I don't need, um, so I think um, I, I sort of see I sort of see the word, I sort of see labels as, as a leather person, I sort of see labels kind of like the, the way I see um, hankies. Mm. You know, uh, I'm into needle play, so I, uh, so I might flag an, uh, a purple hanky somewhere. Uh, I'm into heavy SM, so I might flag a black, a black hanky somewhere. Um, but you know, those, but those are, Ultimately, those are just invitations for conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, just because I flag a, a purple hanky and, you know, you and I might have a conversation about, you know, this purple hanky I'm flagging doesn't mean I'm going to, like, uh, stab you with needles right away or let you stab me with needles. <laughs> you know, it, it just means that, you know, I'm flagging a purple hanky and indicating that I'm into needle play. You spotted my purple hanky and now we're having a conversation. You know, um, I sort of see labels as the same way. You know, um, I, my, you know, I, like I said, I identify as a non-binary non trans person who, is fe who identifies as female-ish. You know, um, ideally, if we're, have, if we're having an interaction that's, that's, that's resulted from me saying that, your, your your reaction would be, what does that mean to you? You know, um, because my experience as a non-binary trans person who's female-ish is, um, you know, find 10 other people who identify similarly as I do, I'm pretty damn sure that they'll have uh, different experiences than I do. Um, so, you know, my labels are, I identify as how I identify, but, certain, but that should, for me, should only be an an introduction into finding out who I am and what my and what my and what what my life is like having having those identities. 
Uh, there were other questions that I somehow missed. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I go on to the next one. Okay, let's go with that. Sure. Uh, yeah, when I was in grade school back in the 50s, um, there was a range of behavior for little girls that was acceptable as a difference of degree. They could be a tomboy, like to play baseball, or they could be a girly girl, would go to the little dances and dance with the other girls and kiss other girls and hold hands. It was always acceptable because everybody kind of assumed they were going to get married and they were girls. It's totally different for boys, though. A young boy back then, if he would kiss another boy, come to school with makeup on, or act effeminate, he became a fag. His father would say, you're not my son anymore, you're a fag. I'm not going to have grandchildren. You know, you're not interested in women. They were a lot of times kicked out of their homes. And at school, they were beat up. And the other boys didn't accept him as a boy. They became a different kind, not a different degree. And I was wondering, teaching young kids now, like the young girls that are tomboys, are they thinking of, them, thinking of themselves as lesbians? How can you get around, if you're starting to put labels on these young children, these terrible things that can happen from that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I have kids too, so maybe I'll say, I'll say as a parent too, some of this stuff. Um, you know, the labels, I think you said it well, the labels existed back then, right? So the fact that there are more expansive labels now and that we uh, ascribe more autonomy to, or agency to children in, in self-identification with those labels is a huge step forward. Um, you know, in my childhood, um, you know, you were called fag all the time for all sorts of reasons, right? You were called a, that was, you know, that's so gay as an expression, right? You could be a boy who, I don't know, likes sushi, right? And that would make you gay, like gay or a fag or whatever, right? So like, um, so like that kind of gender policing is, is, you know, has always been a part of, um, of childhood. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, like the, the term sissy, right? The term sissy didn't really exist in the language before um, the sort of Teddy Roosevelt rough, rough Rider days of like what, when boys were supposed to really be boys in the late 19th and early 20th century. This didn't exist before then, right? Um, so there was more gender expressiveness for boys in the mid 19th century than there was at the turn of the century, for example. Um, so I think that right now, I think, you know, we're in a place where I don't doubt that there is peer-to-peer -peer policing around calling kids out as um, dyke, bag, trans, right? I'm sure that those that trans will be weaponized and is being weaponized against children in the way that faggot was when you were a kid and I was a kid, right? Um, because um, the possibility of the language also creates the possibility for it to be used as a weapon. Um, at Everett Middle School down the street, or my daughter's in seventh grade. She has a friend who identifies as bisexual and another who identifies as gender fluid. Um, she's, I, 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 well, you're filming. I'm not going to say what my daughter I don't know how she's working with gender. But um, uh, she's exploring that as well. And, uh, and I think it's great. Um, but we shouldn't kid ourselves into imagining that just because that's happening, that those kids aren't also being um, harassed and bullied, even at a school right here adjacent to the Castro, right, in, in good old San Francisco. I, I think that the biggest way to combat, whether it's students being shitty, or, um, student, or teachers being shitty, or administration being shitty, is to, have, is to have a supportive network of whatever family needs for that, for that person. Um, you know, uh, I also I, I also think it's really it's really helpful if um, once you know if, if the conversation was had with the kid about you know you know what are you going to do um, to uh, to help them identify the one or two other kids who are also feeling that way because they're you know. Because as a person uh, dealing with queer, you know, identity, sexual orientation, 
stuff and then gender identity stuff. In school, there was nothing worse than feeling like I was the only person. Um, you know, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't even the only person in my family. Uh, but, but you know, there's nothing worse than feeling like I was the only person. So once, so once you know, everybody, everybody is like, okay, um, let's let's deal with this. I think it's, I think it's important for the parent to um, to help. Uh, to help the kid, like be like, you know, but who do you who do you feel you can talk to? Who are your buddies? In this? Because you know things are going to be shitty, um, even in good old San Francisco, uh, things are going to be shitty. Um, so, but dealing with de dealing with um, kids, administration, and teachers being shitty, knowing that there are other people is way better than dealing with kids, administration, and teachers being shitty feeling like you're doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be, that would be my take, or that would be my take. I feel like in terms of the media that children, that I see them, I'm not a child and I don't uh, watch all the shows that the kids <laughs> watch or claim to know everything about what they experience in terms of, um, <laughs> no, see, that's what I'm saying, yeah, I'm not like a, a parent who spends a lot of time I want individually with children, but it seems to be a lot more Cartoons. I'll stick just with cartoons. I won't even go on like who's on cereal boxes. I won't go on any other stuff. Watch more cartoons. It's well, it's kind of interesting. Like um, I was telling the other day that she was like, "Hey, my favorite cartoon is this, this cartoon. I don't know what it's called." And that's it. So you get one of them is like Jewel, who's like in love with this. It, but the gender Wait, was not like, what is it called? Steven Universe. Oh, Steven Universe. Universe. She I'm was describing it to me. One of six people who hasn't seen it. Really weird. <laughs> And that sounds oh, really, like that's really interesting. That would never have happened. Like I could never have seen that after school myself then because there was the internet and like broadcast media was just like corny. It just it still is super corny, but like that's on somewhere and a bunch of kids watch it. So I feel like there are ways that they just have more models or I don't know. I feel like the some of the media they have more possibilities of exploring. That said, media, children's media is also hyper gendered. Yeah. That is, and it's only been in the <laughs> yeah. last few yes. years yeah. that that the commodification of childhood has started to back away from that a little with like Target, like right, not having like the kid, the boys, and the girls section for the toys. And um, the, 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 pr the princess industrial complex <laughs> has started to sort of back off. Like, I, like it must not be as profitable as it once was. So those kids who are coming up um, now are going to have a, a different kind of experience with that than kids from five or ten years ago, when it was, especially for girls. And, like I mean, the binary was intense in, in toys and <coughs> culture. I think of me. There's, yeah. to explain where that gratitude comes from. Um, I am from the Midwest. I grew up in Sioux City, Iowa. Um, there, I thought my only option was to be bi. And then I moved to Utah seven years ago, and I found out that I was poly, and that I was a kinkster. But there, it's also like very down and buried because of religion and politics. And then two years ago, I moved here, and I've never felt like home before. And I found it here. I found that not only am I poly, I'm gender fluid, I'm a little, I'm a leather person, um, I'm, I'm all the things and more. Like every day I wake up with the opportunity to be able to find myself every day. Like um, in April for my birthday, I had my friends shave my head completely bald. And for that, like, what I wanted to do there is I wanted to reclaim for myself who I was. Because growing up, my mom's like, well, to be a lady, you have to have long hair. That's what a real woman does. She never heard me when I said I was bi. She never heard me when I said that I was gender fluid. And so I haven't talked to my mom in 
since I moved here, because she was against it. She's like, oh, it's so dangerous there in California. You don't know. <laughs> yeah. But um, I feel bad for her, because she doesn't know what it's like to have a home. And I appreciate the bravery that it took all of you in your lives to get to where you are. Um, I know um, Cass on a different level, and I know the struggles that you've gone through. And I think that you're an amazing person. And um, you know the marches that you're doing, and the way that you're standing up, um, all of you, um, I think it's incredible. And I appreciate you. And thank you for sharing this heart with me. Um, so, uh, I don't know that I've said this, but, um, but I, I've been, I've been out as a, tra I came out as trans when I was 21, uh, but, you know, I didn't really start sort of all, but, you know, if you, in the last year or so, I'm probably the most female identified as I've ever been in my entire life. Um, and, uh, you know, I occasionally wear dresses, my hair is longer than it's been, no, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, none of that was done because I felt the need to conform to what expectations were. Um, you know, it just, I, because I was, because I've been in a, in a situation, because I've been in communities and situations where enough people whose, matter, whose opinions matter to me tell me that, who, what, you can look like whatever you look like and identify however you uh, however you do and I, we will always know who you are mm -hmm. and we will always love you for who you are that I was able that I've been able to explore what being non-binary femaleish and so on and so forth for, looks like to me mm -hmm. you know so so most of the time I I dress looking like this because it's convenient, it's way more convenient to pull on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and so on and so forth. It's nothing, it doesn't say anything about my gender, it just says, you know, I don't have time to get dressed. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't really wear makeup because I don't know how to do it. Uh, and, um, you know, so, but when I, but when I go to more formal places, I have a few dresses that I really love. You know, my favorite way of dressing up is a, is a, as, is a formal dress and combat boots. Um, that's what being a girl and a womanish person looks like to me. And um, I can say, you know, I can say however, I can have however many gripes I want about San Francisco and Northern California as I wish. But I, but I will say that um, moving here has allowed me to do that. And meeting my community has allowed me to do that. I think there were two comments. I'd just like to hear from both of them. We don't have to respond, but I'd love to just make sure we hear from you and you, right? I guess my response with kind of the kids these days, Rand, so we're all special snowflakes and whatnot, is that personally, I feel like we're building really inclusive communities. I mean, personally, I'm queer and non binary, so like anyone here could be queer, anyone here could be non binary. Like, we all, those are huge categories that encompass so many people. I think that's kind of incredible, and you can respect that, and respect all these new beautiful identifications, and also respect people's materiality and like their lived experience. Because so I know that even though I'm queer and non-binary, most people do not know what the fuck that means in mm -hmm. French, and people just see like a butcher, <coughs> and, and that's my lived experience. So we can all respect each other's how we move through the world and how we feel ourselves, and it's not, it shouldn't have to be a conflict or either or, and also like cis is a really important word, yeah. and like cis privilege is real, and cis mm -hmm. having privilege is real, and it's uncomfortable to be called that, because yeah, it's uncomfortable, white privilege is uncomfortable, able body privilege can be uncomfortable, but it's real, and we have to have words to acknowledge it, and we have to sit with those privileges and take that on, you know, so that's just my little thing to that. <laughs> Um, uh, I don't know if I'm going to express this really 
well. Uh, so yeah, the generation gap or the generation divide is something that I'm also curious about because it's like, it's, you know, there was initially a time for, because I used to identify as just like lesbian and like just a woman, I guess, and then that totally changed with um, more accessibility to queer studies. So I was never, I never took a class, or I never was, I mean, I could read books, but it was just like not knowing what books to read. There were so many books that were geared towards gay men, and I don't know which ones would, like, I could actually explore. And so then I found this thing called Tumblr, and it was amazing because all the stuff, like, was just memes and all these images, and I was like, I identify with that, I get that, whoa, this is really cool, I'm learning so much more, all this new terminology. And the same thing also at the same time, I also transitioned this, like, previous view of, like, what my identity was, like, I started to go, oh, maybe I'm, you know, the word like something like heteronormative kind of came around, right? Where there's like this idea of like a heteronormative queer, like, what? That's so weird. Like, before it was just, you know, the standard, like, you know, male and female and such. And so I, I ugh, sorry, so much anxiety. Um, I'm very curious about this transition and this sort of mutation because um, a lot of what I explored in Tumblr, it seems to have taken things from queer studies. And it has like almost like disseminated to people and made them more accessible in terms of like language and material. And it's also even mutated in a way where it's like almost like some of the stuff that I'm learning is coming directly from like the source of just communities communicating with each other either through mm -hmm. Tumblr or through social media or what have you, maybe even in like physical groups that meet from the internet. And so um, I think of it as like the question of curiosity is like what is the future of queer? Like, you know, right now we have a definition of what queer is, it's like the present, right? But what is like what will like queer in my mind is still like utopia, it's a fantasy, it's something that hasn't been reached yet. It's sort of like something that we're all striving for, right? And so like um I'm curious about like how we can mend that generation gap in the sense that we can I don't think of it as like it's it's almost like this desire, this all this new language or these new labels for me is the sort of desire of like, well, this word was general and now we want to be more specific or we want to like hold accountability where things weren't accountable before. Does that mean like the person is bad because they express those words? Maybe not, maybe it's just more of like, let's hold accountability for it. You know, like before saying something like that was like a racial joke is, was okay and now it's, it's not because it's not. It's, you know, it's like the evolution of that is something that I'm curious of and also your opinions about it, if, you know. Thank you. Because I can tell, I can find ten folks, LGBT folks, just in my circle who hate the word queer, and and so you know, and you know, their their experience growing up is different from my experience growing up, but their experience growing up and their lives are real. You know, um, you know, uh, I, you know, their queer was and sometimes still is used as an epithet. You know, and so I, I think the part of the bridging the gap thing you're talking about is understanding that people, you know, part of the thing about labels is that they're words. But, you know, they're, la they're words that come with experiences. They're words that come with, you know, you know, they're words that come with identity, but identity is a series of experiences. Um, so they're, they're words that come with experiences. And so, you know, part of bridging the gap for me is to, again, use those words and be like, you know, okay, I love the word queer for how beautiful it is. I love the word queer because I identify as queer because I, you know, I was, for example, I was in a relationship with eight men before I first dated my first woman, and my whole world, my whole world view changed for me. Um, so that's what it means for me. Um, but for you, it means a word, the word queer means that, that it's every time you, heard, you got beat up for being gay, you heard the word queer. Both of our experiences are real. And so, and so you know, part of opening and bridging the gap is to, is to understand that my, my associations with words are not the same as your associations with words. And you know, and to be like, you know, you know as much as I, Again, cringe at the idea of um, a label free society. If that is what you, if that is what you strive for as being awesome, then you get to have that. But what does that mean to you, and how do we get there? You know, um, that's I think that's the bridging the gap thing. 
Could I respond to that really quickly? I'm one of the ones that don't like the word queer. It's not because of the reason that you gave, but because of the connotation. Back in the 60s, when I wanted to go into med school, queer was considered uh, strange, different. I wanted to be a respectable member of society, not seen as somebody that was different from society. Mm -hmm. And when people would say, boy, you're queer, but we like to say you're a pervert or you're a degenerate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't want to have degenerate studies in a college. I wouldn't want to have pervert studies mm -hmm. in a college. And it has the same effect for me mm -hmm. when I hear the word queer because I think, you know, the basic meaning is just strange or different. See, I don't see, unlike you, I own all those words. I own, you know, degenerate, weird, and um, and different. But that's just me. Yeah. Uh, those are the, uh, my experiences and my the community that I have had allowed me to be like, you know, all those words you just said that were bad for you are awesome for me. But you know, my life is my life, and your life is your life, and we, yeah. you know, let's talk about that. I think that's what we, that's what that means. Thanks, everybody. I think that would be a great question.